right, well, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. A little bit of review here. We have uh, in chapters 17 and 18, we have Babylon, both religious Babylon and political economic Babylon collapsing. They're collapsing under God's judgment. And uh, we noted what Babylon is. Babylon is a world system that is opposed to God and opposed to God's people. And they have collapsed. Chapter 19, as we enter chapter 19, we see uh, heaven is rejoicing over this fact. The evil is defeated. Righteousness is about to be established. We see the marriage of the Lamb. And uh, we see here... Finally, it's the final consummation, and that is the church and Christ are joined together for all of eternity at this point. And so in verse 11, we see the warrior King Jesus. You know, that's the way that people today don't necessarily like to think about Jesus, but he is the warrior king. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And he's coming in chapter 19 to establish this rule, his rule on this earth. And that's what we're going to look at today. So verse number 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him. Schofield has this note on that verse. He says... The vision is of the departure from heaven of Christ and the saints and angels, preparatory to the catastrophe in which Gentile world power, headed up in the beast, is smitten by the stone cut out without hands. And so here it is, the warrior king coming back to claim this earth as his own. Let's look at some verses in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. It says here, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so we see here this image that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. And this image had the head of gold, it had the silver, it had the bronze, it had the iron, then the feet of iron and clay. And a stone, which was cut out without hands, came and struck at the feet of this statue. And the statue, the image, became a great mountain which filled the whole earth. Now, what in the world is that talking about, okay? Well, we see in chapter, verses 44 and 45 an explanation. And in the days of these kings, and Daniel explains who these kings are. It's, it's Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof, sure. And what we have here is, in Daniel, we have a picture of what's happening here 
in Revelation chapter 19. And that is the stone, the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes to earth and he strikes at Babylon and he sets up his kingdom on this earth in its place. Totally destroys the kingdoms of this world that are set up presently under the headship of the God of this world, Satan. And he sets up his own kingdom here on this earth. Look at Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. It's good to turn in the Bible back and forth to get you familiar with where things are. Isaiah 64 says this. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, tear the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. What do we see here in Revelation 19? We see prophecy being fulfilled. Oh, that the heavens would tear open and the nations would know your glory. May your coming be so hot that it makes the waters to boil on the earth. You know, and so this is what is getting ready to take place in Revelation chapter 19. Prophecy is being fulfilled. All right, so we see heaven opened. We see the white horse, him that sat upon it. And as we're going to see from this verse, it's very clear who this rider is on this white horse. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. It describes this rider as faithful and true. Looking back at Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it's interesting how the whole book of Revelation is one whole. And it's talking about this one man. He is the star. He is the center of this book. And that one man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1, 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He is the faithful witness. Everything Jesus says is true. And he's faithful to keep his promises. So he's faithful. Chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 7, says unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is what? True. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So this is talking again about Jesus, the one who is faithful, the one who is true. It says in righteousness he does judge and make war. Let's turn back to Psalm 45. <coughs> Psalm 45. You know, we think about our world today, and there are a lot of wars that aren't just. They aren't just. But when the Lord Jesus Christ goes to war, it's always for a good cause. It's always for a righteous cause. Psalm 45, verses 1 through 7. My heart is indicating a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. The king here, King Jesus. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God has blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. <laughs> you know, notice the contrast here. There's a, there's a hymn in our hymn book. We probably ought to sing it more often. Majestic sweetness sits enthroned. That's who Jesus is. He's majestic sweetness. So we see here in verse 2, he's fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured in his lips. But then in verse number 3, he gets his sword and puts it on his thigh. <laughs> verse 4, And in thy majesty ride prosperously, because of truth and meekness and righteousness. 
and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Here he is. We see in righteousness he goes out to judge and he goes out to make war. This is the king that's spoken of in Psalm 45. Go back to our text. It describes this warrior king. It says, His eyes, verse 12, were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Back in chapter 1, verse 14, we see these piercing eyes. These all-knowing eyes, the ones that can see down to your soul. Chapter 1, verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Chapter 2, verse 18, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. So here he is, the piercing eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. On his head are many crowns. Whose crowns are on his head? The crowns of those, what's that? The saints that have died. Not the saints that have died, I don't believe here. It's a warrior king. Whose crowns would he have on his head? His enemies. His enemies. Those who has conquered. He's never lost a battle. <laughs> and all those that he has overthrown and conquered, there they are, the crowns upon his head. It says, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. It's a name written that was unknown by humanity. A name written that was unrevealed to humanity because they chose to reject him. They chose to reject him. You know, what is his name that the world doesn't understand, but that his people do understand? It isn't unknown to, uh, to the saints, but it's unknown to this world. What is it? Well, we're going to find it in verse 13. It says, He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. What is the blood on his vesture? Let's look back in the Old Testament and see if we can figure it out. Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> so the warrior king. The warrior king. Says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat? So there's this, this one that's speaking of here who uh, is righteous. And it says his garment looks like he's been treading grapes. You know, red grapes. Blood. Verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. So when it says here, think about the warrior king, right? When it says here, his clothes, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, what is this the blood of? Who? Wrath. What's that? Blood of, wrath. blood of wrath. What do you mean by that? Whose blood is it? Enemies. His enemies, that's right. So the crowns of his enemies are upon his head, and now the blood 
of his enemies are upon his garment. This is not the Jesus that you typically learn about in Sunday school, okay? This is the warrior king who has come to judge and to conquer. And to those that this book was written to, who are being persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're being reminded of who they serve and that he is going to be triumphant over all of his and our enemies. Now we see his name, verse 13. And his name is called the Word of God. Now you ought to know exactly where I'm going to turn here. To the beginning of John's writings. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. The same one who's penning Revelation penned John chapter 1 as well. In the beginning, verse 1, was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Word of God. There's that logos. <laughs> Some of you know a little bit of Greek out there. It is the expression of God to humanity. God is expressing himself to humanity through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. That, meaning the word, was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. His name is called the Word of God. He is the expression of God in this world. He is the expression of God made flesh or become a human body. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see Jesus, you have seen an image of the invisible God. His name is called the Word of God. Verse number 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Who's enlisted in the armies from heaven? Christians. Okay, Christians. Yeah, we're going to see that. But also the angels as well. Angels and Christians coming back with their warrior king, their general, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at some verses that talk about his coming. Matthew 25, 31. Matthew 25, 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. Speaking of Christ coming in glory, which is what's happening here. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Here it is. And then it talks about the judgment of the nations. Um... For 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 7 and 8. It says, And do you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that knew not God, that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to peep into what's going to happen, it tells you here, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. And so he's coming back with his holy angels, in order to judge this world. And for those who have rejected him, 
They're cast forever in everlasting punishment and destruction. How about Jude? That's a little book. That's the little book right before Revelation. Jude, verses 14 and 15. Jude, verses 14 and 15. Talks about Enoch. You remember him from way back? He was one of the two men that never died. He was walking with the Lord, and the Lord took him on to be with him. Back in Genesis. Verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his what? Saints. He's got angels. He's got saints. To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He was talking here in Jude of false teachers, those who oppose Christ and his gospel. And it's saying here that Jesus is coming back with his saints in order to execute judgment against them. Angels and saints, that's who makes up the army that Jesus is coming back with, the warrior king. But it says here very specifically in verse 14 that the followers of Jesus are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse number 8 of this chapter explains who that is. And to her, the church, the wife of the Lamb, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. What is the righteousness of the saints? Or should I say, who is the righteousness of the saints? Jesus. Jesus. That is correct. Verse 15 shows us his weapon. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Look at chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 16. Revelation 1, 16. We see this here. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as a sun shining in his strength. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now here's the question. Does Jesus have a literal sword coming out of his mouth? You know, does his tongue become a sharp sword like in some cartoon you might see? No, no. What is it talking about? Well, let's look at the scriptures and see if we can figure it out. 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Ah, I read a little bit ahead, didn't I? 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. How is he going to take vengeance on them? Well, let's look at uh, Ephesians 6.17. Ephesians 6.17 says here and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is what? The word of God. The sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Isaiah 11 verses 1 through 5 says here, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ coming from the lineage of David. The Spirit of God shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. For with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. 
and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So what is he going to smite the earth with? What does it say there? Verse 4. Breath what? The breath of his lips. And instead of using the illustration of a sword, it says the rod of his mouth. That is what he's going to use to judge the nations. And I had the wrong verse in 2 Thessalonians. It's 2.8. I read the wrong verse. I didn't think that was the right verse. I just misread it here. But 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, which is the beast, the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Jesus comes back, and what does he consume him with what does he destroy him with the of what his mouth. his mouth the spirit of his mouth so what is this sword going out of his mouth that smites the nations God's word. the word of God that's right and it says here he shall rule them with a rod of iron we look at uh, Psalm 2 Verse number 9, I like Psalm 2, it speaks of the conquering Savior. It says, Thou shalt break them, speaking of God, speaking to his anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And I can't help but read the advice that the psalmist gives here. It says, Be wise now, therefore, ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Kiss the Son. That means give reverence to the Son. Honor the Son. Pay homage to the Son. Because Jesus is Lord Jesus is the warrior king, and either the stone can be the cornerstone of your life, he can be your savior if you trust him, or if not, that same stone will crush those who refuse to submit their authority to him. That's exactly what the earth has done in this passage and in this book, and as we can see in this world today. And it says here, he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63, verses 3 through 6. We see the same picture here. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upholded me. And I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Is exactly what Jesus is going to do when he comes back. Trample, trample, trample on the earth. The blood splatter, splatter, splatter. And the warrior king will be triumphant. Why does Jesus do this? Because of who he is. Verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings, and Lord of Lords. Someone said this is the only holy tattoo you find in the Bible. <laughs> I don't think it's a tattoo. But on his thigh, it says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. On his robe, it says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus has the right 
to reign over this world. And if this world refuses to accept his reign, he will force it upon them. And next time we'll see exactly what happens as we come to verse number 17.